Back to Cannabis Canada with Jason Wilcox. This is Tuesday, September 29th, and uh, as always, Cannabis in Canada is reporting on cannabis and the issues it presents in the country of Canada. And tonight on our show, we have Pamela McCall, who uh, is uh, represents um, smart approaches to marijuana in Canada, and has been very active and very vocal um, in, in relation to cannabis. And of course, uh, first off, welcome to the show, Pamela. Hi. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. I mean, thanks for coming on the show. It's, uh, geez, I was going over and I was, I was doing the research on you. I'd done some, uh, it was amazing to see the work you did um, fighting tobacco um, as a former tobacco user. You know, I, I share many of your views uh, when it comes to that particular crusade. And I just wanted to ask you in short, you know, what would one of what your more memorable moments um, fighting big, big business or big tobacco if you have it, um, you know, in your past? Uh, well, you know, I had to pull my father from a, a burning bed. Uh, he lit himself on fire, um, having smoked in bed. And, you know, I don't know if that really stemmed my, my real passion to go after tobacco, but I think it also came from just my understanding of the damage they've done and, and, and still are doing. I mean, they're going to kill 100 billion, 1 billion people in this century, which is 10 times more than the last century. So, you know, I really look to the pirate capitalists, the Americans who went off to the third world and got everybody addicted to nicotine and then came back with their money and went back on their yachts and, and don't care. You know, I, th I think that's really what fuels me and, and uh, it certainly fuels much of my um, efforts with marijuana. Yeah, well, I, I definitely share your share that share that with the tobacco aspect anyway. Because uh, having lost my father to uh, to cancer and, and my mother's lost one breast to cancer, that I certainly uh, I certainly have my objections to tobacco. Um, what, and let me ask you: At what point did, did did the leap come to go from tobacco, um, you know, which clearly is killing people? There's no doubt about this, hands down. To over to cannabis activism, and um, you know, what kind of brought you to that leap? Well, you know, it really, it's still, I'm still after tobacco. I mean, tobacco is after marijuana. I mean, they would love to have their, their paws on the marijuana industry. And if you look at Tilray, um, you know, the guys sitting over in Nanaimo with their $110 million plant and, and the rights they bought to Marty Naturals, which is the worldwide brand of marijuana. I mean, these guys from Yale, their, their model is the tobacco industry. And, and, you know, that's exactly what the tobacco industry is going to do, is just come in here and, and once this is legalized, if it ever is, you know, play hardball and, and, and get the industry. I really see that will happen. And, and there's certainly a lot of Americans I'm working with who, you know, watch this a lot more carefully or as equal, actually as equally as I do, and uh, would say that tobacco is poised to take this over. And that, we think, would be a very serious situation. I agree. Any any big business, I believe big business has moved in onto, onto cannabis, and I think that that's a serious problem. What system? I mean, honestly, we know that this is going to become, uh, uh, you know, different issues with an election coming up. It's very much a hot issue now in the courts, everywhere else. Um, what do you think would be the ideal system for medical marijuana to be dispensed in the country of Canada? Well, I think that's what's really lacking is education, and I think that. Uh, we need to educate people on the science that is available and I think that the pot lobby in, in many ways has hurt themselves and, and are continuing to do so by making false claims or by contradicting solid science and I think that that's really the one reason I wanted to come on your show and talk to you was because I think we all need to calm down number one and I think we it's really too bad that this whole thing has been politicized because all we do in politics is talk 20 second sound bites we don't actually get into anything and I think that that's really unfortunate. So I think we need massive education. And uh, I don't know how long it'll take, but if you look at tobacco, we had the science from the 1920s 19, up to the 1964 when the Surgeon General of America was able to unequivocally you know, pronounce that the use of tobacco led to the death of cancer and um, heart disease. So you know, we're kind of back somewhere in the 20s or 30s with marijuana as far as education. People just don't know. You know, and the science is coming along. So, you know, I, I could take us decades to get there. You know, to a position where people could be educated on this on this drug. 
Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I'll just tell you for myself, Pamela, like I'm a 22 year HIV and hepatitis C positive individual. And um, only for me and like my own experience, it, it's empirical evidence at best, but it's my life experience that I've been able to get rid of 7.5 milligram resterol, oxycodone. I've, got, I've gotten rid of every drug except the antiretrovirals that I actually need to stay alive. And I'm really proud of that. And I tested all the cannabis. And, and I still am a functioning person. So, you know, I really just, I understand that there's, there, there's feelings on both sides, but to, for, for people to p potentially suggest that there's absolutely no medical value um, at, for myself, I'm a medical patient sitting here at 22 years and I, without cannabis, I honestly believe I'd be in a cane or a wheelchair um, due to the pharmaceuticals, the amount of toxicity that would be in my body versus the amount of toxicity that's there versus using cannabis. Okay. Well, so, I mean, in this country, unlike any other country, marijuana for medical purposes is legal, and we have a system in place. And you know, I I know the MMPR is criticized, and you know, when it first came out, you know, a lot of us were pretty upset too because of the size and and the kind of industry, or the kind of big business it attracted. But at least it's a system that has some regulations in place and some and some testing and some limits on advertising and and some control. Um, you know, it does come to the mail, which I think does, you know, help by not having storefronts that children, you know, and youth, I know that you're not, you know, you sort of, I've heard you before and I, and I know that your position on, you know, here they go on the kids thing. But, you know, we have research that shows that in areas where there are medical marijuana dispensaries that, that kids are exposed to, that there is increased of use because of just the normalization of cannabis in general. So, you know, I, 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 I just think that that's really important, um, that we look at the system we already have in place. And, uh, you know, we live in a world of modern medicine, and I understand big pharma. I mean, I'm the one who went to the BC government and fought against nicotine replacement therapy because I know the science isn't there, um, which is backed up by Harvard. And yet we see, you know, Christy Clark giving out $25 million for nicotine replacement therapy pharmaceuticals, which is just a complete, not a waste of money. Um, so I'm not a big fan of big pharma either, but uh, I do think modern medicine and evidence-based science and research um, does save people from quackery and people making false claims. And I'm not saying everybody is, but I'm, there are a lot of people out there saying things that just have no basis in science or well, anecdotal even. You can, know? I, can I ask you, what's your take then on Mr. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, CNN uh, uh, medical correspondent? He was also a Surgeon's General uh, nominee for America. Had a 180 degree turnaround about medical marijuana in relation to kids and in relation to people in general. What would well, you say to that? He's also been heavily criticized by the medical establishment and, and challenged very heavily too. And if you look at what the president of the American um, Epilepsy Society and uh, and the American Pediatric Association this week coming out and what they're saying about marijuana, you know, they're why he did what he did, why he did he said the things he said, um, and what he based his comments on, um, you know, I certainly don't support. Well, the thing is, Pamela, is that there's there's not just people like Mr. Gupta, which is again a very high-profile doctor. Um, there's also the the courts. I mean, we have the Supreme Court of Canada, who since 2001 have said medical patients have a right to use cannabis, and you know that's a constitutional right. The one thing we all could agree we hold dear in this country is the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So, what would you say to those patients who have the support of their doctor, the support of the federal government, and they just want access to their medicine, reasonable and dignified access? What would you say to them? I would say there's the MMPR, and it's a system that we have to work within. And if there's something wrong with it, then it should be fixed. And, and people should be absolutely going to Health Canada and the government of Canada and saying, you know, this isn't good, this isn't good, and improving it. But working outside the system and just breaking the law, um, I don't think is the route at all to take. And I think that it sets up for all kinds of people to come into it who have, you know, no checks and measures. And... And so it, I think it actually hurts you very much. I think it really has done a lot of damage. I mean, I watched City Hall, and I heard a doctor stand up and recommend it for, for constipation. I mean, this is not a drug that one should recommend for constipation. I mean, that was embarrassingly, ridiculously silly. Uh, that's, again, I mean, I've known people with Crohn's disease, Michelle Rainey, God bless her soul, um, well-known activist, and, and again, and myself, uh, uh, being on oxycodone in the past, being prescribed in the hospital and coming out, using cannabis suppositories to help me go to the bathroom, 
I can only speak again empirically to my own evidence. And the book that's sitting here beside me, um, it's a it's a handbook of cannabis, and it's actually, uh, you know, it's from the uh, a high end university. It's got the latest evidence, and it's full of empirical evidence. Where I agree with you, education is the way, and communication, dialogue, like we're having here tonight, um, just about what is medical cannabis in the country of Canada. Right. So, um, uh, right. do you? Now, how do you think that this is going to play out here? We got an election coming up this year, and this is a very, very hot topic. How do you think this is going to play out as far as medical versus recreational and uh, in relation to the election? Well, I don't know. You know, I, I, um, I did an interview earlier today, and I, and, I, and I would say this again. I think it's a missed opportunity by all three leaders to have discussed this topic. I think it's um, you know, top of mind for many of us. I think it affects a great many people. And I think that by this election not having discussed this in a better way, I think is really unfortunate. I mean, I think all three parties could have said a lot more about cannabis and uh, and about you know not only medical marijuana but recreational marijuana, and and we could have had a better debate, better public discussion. But you know, we're now down to a couple of weeks, and and I and I really pointed out, I think all three leaders really missed this opportunity to talk about this, and you know, we've got youth in this country, um, you know, using it at very high rates. And uh, that's something that we've all got to come together and address because, you know, you're going to get a lot when you've got the rates, you know, the highest in the industrialized world in this country um, of grade 12 students using marijuana. We have a problem and it's a problem that's shared by the pot lobby and by everybody else. Um, we've got to get those rates down and how we do that. Um, could have been part of this election. I, I really think it could have been. And I agree with you. Now, on that election, I mean, um, Genghis Reid poll just recently, six out of ten Canadians would agree with legalization and, uh, and some sort of standardization so that there isn't drug dealers and there isn't, you know, things are handled in a standardized and regulated way that, you know, is, uh, is appropriate for Canada. And, well, uh, and not necessarily for big business, like that's what I'm opposed to. So you and I share similar, um, like I'm, a, I'm opposed to big business, big, big cannabis, big business coming into Canada and telling us what I have to buy after being a legal patient for 15 years, supplying myself, I'm now told what I have to buy for a highly inflated cost, you know, that I can't afford or go back on the toxic treatment that the doctors will give me being traditional therapy that's covered under my pharmacare. Right, um, right. I think that um, the issue, you know, which you just raised, is that it's not that the market for marijuana is a youth market in this country at the moment, and and legalization will not end the fact that kids want to get drugs and they're going to get them from illegal sources, which means crime's not going anywhere. And the studies we've show we have from the Rand Corporation in different places, and the evidence in the United States and different places that have legalized, um, is that it will increase the use of marijuana by youth. And if that happens, you know, they're going to buy their drugs illegally. They have to. And, and so that's the problem with this. Uh, legalizing at this time, um, how, do you, how do you address that? I mean, I, I, I think it's a false argument to say that crime's going to go down. I, I don't think it will. It hasn't in Colorado. And, it, and what, it, what? it won't in Canada. If the rates of use by youth go up, they have to be serviced by crime. You know, in, in we've got to get the rates of youth down. We've got to. Well, no, I agree with you. Now, in Colorado, though, the, the crime rates have went down, aside from people bringing stuff in over the border. I mean, as far as uh, uh, cannabis-related crimes, robberies, break-ins, uh, rips, people breaking into each other's houses to steal plants, doesn't happen because there's just a, there's enough there, and it, it's kind of balancing itself out uh, with the equation. Uh, but on to the safety with children. Now, you're right, I do reference this sometimes, but I have a daughter. She's 16. And I'm very proud father. She turns 16 tomorrow, actually. And, um, you know, I, I'm with you on kids don't need to be marketed to. But there's a reasonable and sensible approach to this. And when we look at cannabis, we have to put this into the context of when we say addiction with kids, we have to put it into the context of what addiction. So cannabis is as, as addictive as what? Caffeine. Caffeine is just, it's more addictive, it's more toxic, and it has a lethal death dose. Cannabis doesn't. So well, no, in that, no, in, in the that, addiction rate for cannabis is one in two for daily users, and 27% of the people, of people 15 and over, who reported cannabis use in the last three months in this country, 27% of them said it was daily use. So daily use addiction rate is one in two, which is more than tobacco or alcohol, which is one in 11. So, and also the potency comes into this too. So, you know, you can't just say it's more or less than alcohol or tobacco or caffeine. You got to look at the real deal here, if they're using it every day and they're using shatter, 
they're going to get addicted. I'm sorry. That's just going to happen. Well, again, I, I, the, the, the term addiction is in the sense of if a kid runs out and drinks a, a monster wake-up drink and gets a bunch of caffeine, they're going to get addicted to wake-up drinks and they're probably going to start drinking them a lot. I just don't see... The, I, I'm just trying to draw the correlation that cannabis is the same as caffeine and running out and drinking a bunch of that and it will get you high. Only it can kill you. Well, the mortality rate for marijuana abuse is higher than alcohol or cocaine. So people who get into really big trouble with marijuana um, have a higher mortality rate. So it does kill people. And, well, and if you don't think, th this is the kind of science that we need to talk about. Because if you're talking about, you know, infrequent use, and you're talking about THC at 15% or, or something like that, you're talking daily use of THC at 99%, you've got a really big problem. No, you're, I mean, you're right to the degree that tolerance, resistance, and all this needs to be sorted out by the doctors and the people that are in charge of, of so-called medical care. I see this as a herb that is no more harmful than caffeine and really needs to be looked at as such. But the marketing to kids, I mean, the one thing that I agree with is, yeah, I don't want my daughter marketed cannabis. I mean, I don't want anybody offering my daughter cannabis. It's not the corner street drug deal. I don't want anybody doing it. You know, but at the same time, I want to know that if my daughter gets cancer or MS, she can access cannabis to deal with her illness because I know in my heart, in my own empirical evidence, not because somebody has told me, but because I believe in my research of 20 years that it would truly help them. So uh, what this about, is... What about pregnancy? Like, what about if she's pregnant? What do you, what do you think? Or, or plans to have a family? There hasn't and been enough research. What we know about the damage to sperm and ovum. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think of that? I think that there isn't enough... Ex I know that women naturally produce cannabinoids out of their breast milk, and that cannabinoids is what you get from cannabis when you smoke it, and that's the medicinal properties. That's all I know. But would I suggest my pregnant wife go smoke cannabis? Just like I wouldn't suggest she go smoke cigarettes, just because I don't know. But I'm going to be honest about know. that. We do know because we have the University of Ottawa. We have very, you know, major studies that have gone on for decades now that the use of cannabis during pregnancy actually has an impact on the cognitive development of the baby's brain. And the pot lobby has been very um, uh, critical of of comments like that, and they've referred to the Jamaica study. But what we found was the Jamaica study didn't study the children long enough. The damage shows up in kindergarten doesn't show up. Smoking baby, people who use tobacco, the damage shows up early. And so they were comparing tobacco babies to marijuana babies. But when you studied it over decades, it started to show up. When they followed these kids in the kindergarten and grade one and grade two and grade three, they found the cognitive damage. And so now we have like neuroscientists, some of the leading scientists in the world who are researching this and coming up with this information. And then we try and get out there to tell people, don't recommend this for pregnancy, don't recommend it for morning sickness, and we get slammed. You know, and that's, and, and we just want to tell people that. Like, we just think that if you want to use it for medical purposes, okay, but you've got to know that there's some contraindications. And so when you get it from the MMPR, at least you get a little card in your box that says, don't use it if you're going to be pregnant. So that's, you, you don't walk into a Vancouver dispensary and have somebody give you a little card that says, don't use it if you're pregnant. So we're just waiting to find all these pregnant people who are going to sue everybody because they're going to. Do because you, they you, weren't told, you, and their kids are going to get hurt, and and that's see that's all we're trying. That's really all I'm trying to do here. I've never told anybody in my entire life not to smoke cannabis ever. I've also never told anybody not to smoke a cigarette. That you're an adult, you do what you want to do. But I am devoting a great deal of my time to helping pregnant women and all kinds of people who don't want to get hurt by this drug and need to know the minimal science that we do have that I think is evidence-based. Okay, so... I think it leads to lung cancer. I think we will prove that. I'm, I'm, I'm no, we have to know that. No, again, I, I, I'm with you that we need to have more studies. The empirical evidence is just why we keep winning in the courts. In the Constitution, the Supreme Court of Canada said that Canadians, medical patients who are qualified, can use cannabis in all of its forms. Is simply because the courts have seen the evidence that Mr. Kurt Tussaud has put forward. Though, be it empirical, and I have the book right here, what we submitted, you know, this is what went towards the courts. It's what the Crown accepted as evidence because it's empirical. But... It's the evidence we got, and it goes back to the 1800s, Pamela. It goes back to the 1800s, and it saves. For century, we have neuroscience. We have neuroimaging now. You know, Dr. Philip Siemens on our board of directors. He discovered the dopamine receptors of the brain. Like this is these are the kind of people we've got as our resources here, who 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 deserve to be listened to. I mean, these are really these are people who devote their whole lives to the study of this drug on the brain. They're not. 
you know, they have no interest in anything else. I, no. I know there's some people that do, but these people don't. And, I mean, I'm, with, and, and, and I'm with you, though. But I mean, look at Dr. Sanjay Gupta. I mean, we've got lots of doctors. Dr. Russo, who's done many of books, tons of studies, empirical evidence, right down to our own Dr. Paul Harmy here in Canada, who has his own peer-reviewed journals. We've got lots of doctors on both sides. What we need, like I agree with you, educational proper dialogue where we can talk about what is medical marijuana and then we'd have to talk about patient access because as much as you're against dispensaries I'm for them for patient access I'm worried about the patients I represent and myself having access to my medicine and not having to rely on a mail order system and a wait list and a doctor that doesn't want to sign for something that's and not his book and, and I'm more worried about the Dana Larson's I'm more worried about the people who are trying to make money and really you know, are, are selling things and, and there's no credibility to or to back up some of the claims that, you know, people like him would be making. So, you know, that's really, um, you know, it's a it's a frontier at the moment. And, you know, for the person who might be out there trying to do, um, you know, something that's really legitimate, there's somebody else on the side trying to make a buck and and they don't care who they sell to and they don't care what they sell it to them for and they don't care who they are. I mean, they just don't care. They're trying to make money. No, I, I, and, I, and I just think there's got to be some checks to this. There has to know? be checks. No, I'm with you. There has to be checks and balances. And I, I just don't believe that why, that displacing. I mean, I don't know whether you know this, Pamela, but 50,000 medical patients like myself are serviced by these dispensaries. Now, we need the city or somebody or the police, whoever, to regulate and make sure that things, checks and balances are in place, food safe, everything else. Well, the police are, that isn't the police's job. That isn't the police's job. It's Health Canada's job. It's the job of the government, the federal government to do this. It's not the job of the police. Police are not public health officers. You know, they're not medical people. They're, they're just supposed to uphold the laws and they shouldn't be, um, you know, taking on public policy. It's not, we're not, they're not elected. They're, they're paid people and, and it's not appropriate they should have the discretion to decide drug policy it's well, they, to be fair well. the Vancouver Police Department do have discretion on what they want to enforce and they have said um, even I mean honestly Pamela they've responded to you and so has City Council from Vancouver the police chiefs and City Council have just rejected your your request to shut down um, and they were heavily criticized for doing that and we are waiting to see what Health Canada is going to do in the, in the next week with those 13 letters they sent out so you know I just I, I just think that you just don't break the law. If you don't like the law, I think you change the law through advocacy. I, I just don't think you go and break it. And I think that because in this country, you actually can get marijuana for medical purposes legally, unlike any other country. I mean, you can get it here. So, you know, to sort of not like the way the program's set up and then go and break the law um, and, and subject the population to... I, mean, I really do call it quackery. There are people out there that are selling marijuana who are unscrupulous. No, Pamela, um, I have to, I just let me jump in here because this is where I have to jump in because Health Canada has been ruled unconstitutional uh, once and soon in Allard to be twice, but once in R versus Smith. A brand new program is unconstitutional. So if we want to talk about violating citizens' rights in Canada, both of us, I'm sure, could agree violating the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is a fundamental violation of Canada. Right, but I think also violating the rights of the child, which is a United Nations treaty, which is the most ratified piece of human rights legislation in international law, um, I think is also a violation of human rights. And I think a child needs to be protected from cannabis use in the home. I do. I think that the lack of education, that people don't understand what this does, I don't think they understand what secondhand smoke impacts a child. Um, you know, I, so if you're talking human rights, I'm talking human rights of children. And I think that as an adult, um, that's the highest, yeah, highest if possible. We were, if we, um, but Pamela, if we were to legalize, if we were to legalize, my daughter and I have had these discussions because she doesn't smoke, and I'm proud. I've raised her to be that way. Whatever she, I told her, you choose to smoke, you choose to smoke. When we legalize, and we will, because they're going to follow the money in America. When we legalize, Pamela, uh, what are you going to? How are you going to handle people that are just going to be able to smoke and walk down the street and medicate? I mean, hopefully they open up dispensaries. Well, that's so not people, the case in Colorado. It's a thousand dollar fine if you walk down the street because and smoke they allow joint. dispensaries. Pamela, which they don't want to allow here in Vancouver, unfortunately. I'm with you on that one. Let's get them off the street and let's get them into establishments so that it's not bothering people in public that don't like cannabis. I'm with you on this. No, I just don't like it. Don't want to be killed by secondhand smoke. 28% of people who die from secondhand tobacco smoke are children. 
Right, well, again, this is a, this is all debatable secondhand smoke stuff, but I'm with you on the part that you shouldn't be forced on it, just like I shouldn't be forced to have to worry about where I medicate or, or that I shouldn't get access to my medicine. There has to be a middle ground found somewhere. And, and of course, uh, the mortality thing. I mean, the, you and I could bat around studies all night long on empirical Absolutely. evidence. And I agree with you. I, and, yeah, exactly. I mean, they're out there. And, and I'm glad we're having this dialogue because it shows people that there is smart dialogue happening and people are looking at the studies and we're reviewing and we're learning from one another as we go along and it's important and, that we, we, and whatever does happen whatever does happen this election we, we we are canadians we live together we live in a civilized society we shouldn't be fighting we shouldn't i mean we really shouldn't be fighting we should figure out okay if that's what the courts say if that's what happens or that's when the election was that's what the democratically elected you know government of the day decides to do then we all have to work with that system. And so, I mean, that's what I would say even to defend this government, um, that we have to work within a democratically elected government. And that's what we have right now. If you don't like the government, you change the government. If you don't like the law, you change the law. But you just don't break it. You know, it's just, it's kind of fundamental sort of, you know, civilization, you know, rights and responsibilities. I, that's just my personal thing. I'm, I'm a real law and order kind of person. Um, and I do advocate. Look, I spend hours of my day every day advocating for my, my position. Um, and I know you do too. And so there's lots of other Pamela, people. Pamela, honestly, I Pamela. You break the law. You know, but, but, Pamela, but Pamela, you support women's rights, I'm sure. You support women's, women's rights? Yeah. Yeah, I'm a feminist. Of course. Yeah. Okay. So now when the women were burning their brows in public and it was illegal, you supported that? Yeah, but I don't think that's quite the same as the. As I don't know. Marijuana it is the same. It's a political. It's a political. It's a political. Actually, but I've never been it's passive brother. civil disobedience, <laughs> Pamela. It's passive civil disobedience. Seriously, it is. You know, I, I understand your position, and we agree on a lot of things. But that is passive civil disobedience, and that's Pretty what we're broad doing. A parade is different than opening a retail store and selling to people. It's to and change saying policy, that it's good for though. That it isn't. The objective so, was to change policy. You did a great job. Women have rights now. We're trying to change policy so cannabis users have rights. Yeah, there's a way of doing that. One's of civil dis disobedience, one's a parade, not opening up 100 stores in Vancouver and flaunting the law. I mean, I just don't think that's correct. That's just not my way. I would. That's not what I would be doing. And I think that it's upset a lot of people. And I and I and now here's something like uh, for a patient like for me it's it's frontline service like being able to go in and, and talk about the strain, know what I'm getting, and I think that that's important. But also I'd like to know it's standardized. There's no mold. I'd like to know it's been food safe. So I'm with you to a degree. I'd like to know why you feel the mail order system where I don't get to see that, I don't get to talk to the person, and it just comes in the mail and my kid could potentially get it, you know, or, or, or it's still accessible in the home, you know, like anything else. I don't see how the mail order system is any different. So I'm try I'd like to get your thoughts on how the mail order system is better than a frontline system with security, a front, well, like a store system. Well, our, our data shows us there's a 98% abuse of of um, the dispensaries by people buying it for recreational purposes, 98 percent, only two percent of people. That's the that's the research we have. Um, so well, these that, stores are very accessible. Here, here's my research, honestly, Pamela. They also this, go in and buy pot and sell it to other people. Here, here's no, some, they do that. Here's some federal research on on, on Allard. Like I, I I funded Allard. I worked on Allard with the coalition. Uh, there is in BC 50 percent of all federal licensees which is 41,000 last we noted for court. So right. that's like 20,000 medical marijuana registered federal legal yep. medical marijuana users in the province of British Columbia. So we, right. we certainly can't, uh, we can't underestimate why there would be so many dispensaries because there's that many people needing access versus other regions of the country where of course there may be one or two dispensaries because there's not nearly as many medical patients with the federal right to access medical marijuana. My issue is that the MMPR just simply can't provide access. They're failing the medical patients and if we shut down all these dispensaries we displace them. Well, and then they're, then they're relying on corner street drug dealers. And I think we could both agree we don't want them relying on corner street drug dealers if they're in a wheelchair or a walker. Well, sure, no, but the thing is I just said a lot of this is abuse and they aren't using it for medical purposes and plus the we found out that only 11 of the 37,000 registered people by March 31st of, of 2014, right, who were eligible for medical marijuana, only 11,000 of them have ever even accessed MMPR or even tried it. So they didn't even try. They just stayed with the dispensaries that were already existing. So were you, were you I don't know how they can say how they failed I, them when they didn't even no, give them a try. Can I, can I throw one more? I actually don't want to defend the MMPR. 
No, um, but let me, let me I, just throw I, one study. I agree with you, some problems with it. Let but. me throw let me throw one study that might help the, you know, understand that factor is just because out of the 41,000, 36,000 yeah. of them chose to grow at home for themselves and they didn't access any system. They were self-sufficient. That's why. Honestly. Okay, we have 11,000 okay, 11, that access. But yeah, okay. No, I'm just, that's now. I'm just saying at the time that Allard started and all this MMPR stuff started, 36,000 right. patients of the 41,000 registered chose to grow their own medicine and didn't access any licensed producer. At the time, there was only Brett Settle and uh, Prairie Plant Systems Incorporated. Now there is, it's now Bedrocan and uh, in, in Tweed, etc. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, the, the point is that the 36,000 that grow for themselves is why there's not a lot. And I'm glad there's 11,000 accessing, but you know what, Pamela? Health Canada, through legal discovery, said there's 1 million medical marijuana users in Canada. After one year in existence, why aren't they accessing the MMPR if it's so successful? Uh, I don't think anybody's saying it is successful, but it should be. It should be. There's got to be a way of making that a better system. There just has to be. And, and uh, whatever's wrong with it has to be fixed. I mean, you know... I don't know if it's cost or I've, I, we've checked into the time delay. It's 72 hours um, door to door from them to you. It's we've checked that we had that um, verified. So it doesn't take three months to get medical marijuana from an MMPR. But um, if it's too expensive, that's another issue. You know. Um, well, there's definitely a cost issue. There's a reasonable access. I've always believed that a patient should have a right to grow access it uh, if it wants to be an LP dispensary, whatever, but have a frontline service, or they can order it from the mail if they wish, but they should have patient option, but that's just uh, my own opinion. But again, we can bat that, we can bat around, this will morph itself out in time. It's a matter that we have these discussions so that people can actually have sensible discussion, a sensible dialogue and not, you know, social media drama. Uh, just on, now let's talk about cannabis in, 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 in per, if, forgive me if I don't pronounce this right, uh, carcinogens. Um, let's talk about, uh, put this into context because a lot of people are, are, are telling me that, hey, Pamela is, is connecting cannabis to cancer. Is this the case, Pamela? Well, American Lung is, not me. Um, I just read a lot of data. I've talked to some of the leading research in the world and, and when I ask them the question, they say probably. So we're coming there and we'll get there, I think. And I think that I have heard from BC Lung that if you use marijuana with tobacco, your chance of premature death goes from 50% to 80. Um, the combination of tobacco with marijuana is a very dangerous thing. Um, so those are the studies that worry me. Those are the findings that are coming along. Like I said, I feel like we're in 1950. You know, yeah. 1950, a lot of people didn't know about tobacco. By well, 1989, like right they did. I'm and sure. I just think we're going to look at a couple of decades from now and we're going to go, why didn't we tell, why, you know, it's so sad that the pot lobby were so belligerent and that they wouldn't allow the science as it came along. They fought scientists and science every step of the way, exactly like the tobacco industry. And it was all in the name of greed and profit. And, and that's why I do what I do, because I've seen the pot lobby and I don't, I'm not saying everyone in the pot lobby, I'm just saying there's a fraction of it that is so aggressive that they will take on, you know, people like Dr. Kevin Sabat, people like myself, um, all kinds of other people that were in our movement who's just trying to educate people well, and, these and are, take us out. I mean, well, I'm they, just, with you. they want to take us out. I'm with and you, Pat. have a I'm, conversation. No, I'm with, I'm with you on the conversation. That's why we're doing this. But I mean, yeah. when it comes to throwing out words that are cancer related, because normally carcinogens are associated with, uh, with gamma rays and alpha particles. And when we're talking about cannabis, and carcinogens, we're talking about naturally occurring carcinogens. And they can occur in peanut butter, in rice, not, uh, sorry, in uh, rice, in nuts that are on store shelves and in the house. So that's the context. Why did so, California place it on the list of carcinogenic endangered, like they have it on the list of things that can cause cancer? That's the state of California. It's one state. It's one study. I'm just wondering if, it, it, again, it, it, was that smoked form? Was that edible form? What was it? I can send it to you. I've got it. I can send please, it to you. Please do. Please do. Because I'm always yeah. open to hearing this. This is how we get the proper dialogue. It's yeah. just so that our viewers can understand when we're talking about carcinogens, we're actually talking about naturally occurring ones, and they do. They occur on nuts. They occur organically. And if you're growing cannabis, of course, it could occur. So there is that possibility, but it's not the carcinogens that people or carcinogens that people associate to tobacco is is kind of where I'm going with this. Uh, well, American lung, I think, is going to have it. I, I'm, there, things are coming along here, and, and that's my big worry. Right. Is that uh, is that uh, the science is going to come out, and all these people are going to be hurt, and and I just, you know, I just hate to see an industry take off before we have that science. 
Yeah, well, the one thing about the science, I'm glad you say that, because again, when you, when you watch our interview back, um, you'll see I got my book out here that I'm studying right now, and this is what we introduced in Allard as evidence for empirical evidence on medical marijuana, because of course, Canada holds that there is no medical value to marijuana. And, and, right, and every major medical association in the United States, Canada, and the UK. Um, no, yes, but no, uh, we're, we're not alone here. <laughs> like, the Canadian know. mental, uh, Canadian, um, oh geez, what are they here? C A M H. I have them in my notes. They've come out for legalization, and they're for yeah, mental we health. We also took mental, that report apart. But no, anyway. but you know, you, but if you tear it apart, either way, it is their position paper to legalize for mental health and addictions. Yeah, so then, how, how can you challenge the highest? Prohibitionists, where there's how, a huge philosophical, there's an ideological difference between a, a, someone who's a harm reductionist and a prohibitionist, right? And, well, uh, I, I'm they're, a harm, they're harm reductionist. reductionist you know? I, I'm a harm reductionist, but I mean, I just don't, yeah, I can't see that connection. So it's, let's look at one more thing here, Pamela. Just, I don't want to keep you on too much longer. It's, uh, it's been a great interview. Let's look here at just, uh, I got a thing here where you said, look at the tax revenue model for alcohol and tobacco. We lose against the public health costs 10 times over. And I'm with you. On alcohol and tobacco, we lose because the damage it does to the organs and the internal parts of the body and the cancer-causing factors with uh, with tobacco. So right. now with that being said, um, you went on to say that um, we'll never make money off taxing pot, nor should we morally do so when the market for pot is for our kids and the addicted. I'm not a kid and I'm not addicted. I'm a medical patient that uses it to save my life. Right. So I kind of take exception to that statement that I wanted to just address you on. That's as a fine. medical patient and for those medical patients I, I out think there. it's callous to um, think that, to, to brush aside all the public health costs and the damage to human beings from a public health point of view um, to make money from a tax. What I about find the that, profit to human I life? I just find though. it callous. I just find it very what about, callous. That, but what that about, should be the priority. I think we should have that, that I mean, that should just be an afterthought or a, it shouldn't be the reason that one would legalize marijuana. You should, you should think about the public health this should be a public health issue, and uh, and and we should look at the damage that marijuana can do to different populations, including addiction, but also all these other things I'm talking about, like what happens to kids in school and dropout rates and all these things, um, and and measure that. But to to do it to make tax, I think it's just it just it just I find, I just find it very callous. No, I'm with you. We need to we need to stop big business, and um, and and it should not be monopolized. It should be looked at, and as it is, for medical reasons. And right. and again, the empirical evidence suggests the host of things. My own life, it's it's gotten me off. It's my sleeping pill. It's my nausea pill. It's my pain pill. It's my everything pill. It gets me through my day. And and I'm hoping that one day people will. Will, uh, in, the, in Canada will better understand what's going on, but most importantly recognize that the legislative arm being the Liberal Party and the MMPR have set up... You mean, you that, mean the Conservative Party? Well, I would say the Conservative Party is in on this, but I'd say more so Chuck Rafishi, the Chief Financial Officer of the Liberal Party, founded Tweed. So these okay. big companies and Tilray, they're the ones that I'm fighting because it's big right. cannabis. It's big business coming in to take over Canada and force this on us. And I scare, I'm scared they're going to go and put chemicals in there and start doing what the tobacco industry did to tobacco. Because well, I am already a doing farmer. GMO. We already know that. We already know right on. That. So the, yeah. we're on the same page on that one then. So no, that, absolutely. Absolutely. I watched Cannabis Inc., um, the documentary on Tilray by ABC Australia. I helped them with it, actually. They were here. And... Uh, I mean, it just, I don't know if you've seen it, but it sends shutters down your spine. I mean, there should, they should never have been allowed in this country, ever. Right, and I, I, honestly, I've been asking myself and, I, and my team, and we've been doing this here, we've been investigating it, I've been going after Chuck Rafishi and the Liberal Party. I don't know how they could set up, if there's no medical value to marijuana, and Ronan and all their friends can set up this big multi, again, these are $25 million companies in Canada to take over, it, uh, and, and you're right, they're not here, they're here for 20-year ROIs, return on investment. They're, so they're pirate capitalists. Yeah. They, they're pirate capitalists and they're predatory industries. That's what they are. They're going after our children. That's who they are. And our medical patients. The ones I represent, they're looking to yes. monopolize them, jack up yes. the price, take their disability checks, and make them hurt. And that's yeah. why I have an issue with the monopoly. Yeah. I, well, I think you and I share some common ground on all of that. Um, I just, what do we do now? You know, that's sort of where we're at. So. Well, I think we but, keep uh, it, I we think, keep... um, yeah, it's just, we've got to get the science out there. I just want to do that. Um, got to stop the shysters and the quackery. That's got to end. Um, 
because it just it discredits what you're doing so much. You yeah. know, the rest of us out here just go. I mean, just you know, amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, we we can't lend Doctor. Oh, we we, we got to be careful not to lend a whole book of science to, you know, when you when we take a full book of empirical evidence, we don't want to throw that out. But we also don't want to throw out the good doctors that truly have done their research and say, hey, there's damage. What we need to do is find out what is medical marijuana before we try and govern it. And in the meantime, leave the medical patients alone and their right to autonomy, so they can access it in a reasonable and dignified way. And, you know, until this is sorted out and people like ourselves can continue to have reasonable discussions where, you know, there, like you said, there isn't a lot of uh, arbitrary negativity and we can come to some sort of understanding and dialogue of, uh, of where we're at, regardless of our, of our political positions or, or, or positions on cannabis in general. Sure. So, uh, pa Great. Pamela McCall, well, thank you Great. for coming on the show. And uh, honestly, I look forward to having you back on again as things heat up. And uh, yeah, keep on your thing and keep after those LPs because I, I think that's one thing that we share. We may not share views on the other issues. Um, I'm out to fight for the medical patients of Canada, and I certainly don't want to sell them out to big business. So on that note, this is Jason Wilcox. Stay tuned for the Thursday Night Live show, everybody. And uh, yeah, we'll see you then. Cheers.